Okay, it's 12.04, so we'll call the Economic Development meeting to order. If the Executive Assistant will please call roll. Black. Here. Wolgeman. Here. Tech. Here. Rindy. Here. Riopel. Here. Salt. We do have a quorum present. Um, due to having some guests, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna jump ahead on the agenda. We're having some guests here, so we're gonna move into new business um, into the multi-jurisdictional Grand Forks website. It's you. Okay. <laughs> Please use the mic. So I'm going to sit then, if that's all right. Um, about a month or so ago, um, I was here and shared some of the, the workforce initiative that the Grand Forks Region Economic Development Corporation has um, undertaken with the Chamber, UND, Convention and Visitors Bureau, and um, we talked about a website that we were going to be launching, and we've now since launched that, and so I'm here today to share with you how um, all of that has come to fruition. We met, uh, oh, starting about the first part of the year with a group of um, HR executives in the region and got their input and feedback to help develop a support mechanism for employee recruitment into the region. And one of the things that they identified as a need is a central place to point people to. When they're recruiting people for positions in the Grand Forks region, you know, we can tell them all about our company, all about um, the employment opportunity that we're offering, but a central place to point them to to help um, give them information and a feel for what the Grand Forks region is, is like as a place to live and work and, and play. Um, that is a tool that, that they could use. It, that was the feedback that we received. And so that was the uh, first step of what we hope is um, many more in supporting employment in the region. And so what we set out with the input and the feedback of this HR advisory committee is we developed a theme to build, to build that central portal around. And we really felt it necessary, you know, one of the big perceptions of this area we all know is that it's really cold here and we shut down in the winter and that's not true. And yes, it's cold, but it, we have four seasons, let's celebrate our four seasons and let's not shy away from the fact that, that we have those. Um, and so we really set out to develop um, a sustainable recruitment and retention toolkit. It's really intended to be a resource for employers um, as a, a place to help them support their employee recruitment. Um, the portal, the web, the web site that I have up here on the screen in addition to um, three social media sites that we are using as part of this effort, to, um, we really wanted to present a united front um, with some coordinated resources in a one-stop entry point for people. Um, in, within this context, what we really hope to do as we continue to build this out, and keep in mind this is just the starting point, this is not the end point, um, is really to um, showcase the benefits of the region, to showcase the amenities, the attributes, and, and highlight all of the things that we appreciate, um, all of us in this room, about living and working here in the region. So we really um, developed from some focus group meetings that we had with this HR advisory group, some of the key messages and some of the things that they really felt were important um, to highlight. And within the context of the site, where are my headers? Oh, it's showing up as mobile here. Okay, um, we're really um, highlighting five key areas. Friendlier living, which is all about our communities, our neighborhoods, our towns. It's not just a city of Grand Forks website, it is a Grand Forks region website. Um, we highlight communities throughout the region. We highlight things like 
the commute times, which is a huge benefit. Military. Um, the Grand Forks Air Force Base has already really embraced this and is starting to use this in part of their recruitment effort with airmen, with civilian employees. We talk about um, all of the things that there are to do for, for kids. Um, pets were a really important feature for many of the people within our organ within the um, HR advisory group that we engage. So highlighting different areas there. Our school systems, our public, our private, um, our university and college, the, all of the lifelong learning opportunities that we have here through continuing ed programs and, and different things like that. And better opportunities talking about not it's not a job posting site. We aren't intending to, to replicate information that's already out there, but the types of careers that are available here, the entrepreneurial environment, the volunteer opportunities in the region, the healthier people. This region is really, you know, we have a strong um, spiritual, mental, physical um, environment for healthy living, and that's important to people nowadays. We're really targeting this, this website um, to that, that key recruitment demographic, that 25 to 45, 50-year-old um, age range is really who this is intended to speak to. Um, livelier events, all of the, the uh, amenities that we have within the region for arts and culture, dining, um, sporting events as a spectator, um, all of the different things that, that there are to, to do here. And we also touch on the website of all of the things that there are to do within a really reasonable driving distance as well. Things like Turtle River State Park or Pembina Gorge or the Itasca State Park, all of those kinds of things that are really a hop, skip, and a jump away from us. And so we're doing that. Um, now starting to promote through social media, through some targeted advertising, um, targeting people who are looking for jobs in the Grand Forks region, people who are looking for homes in the Grand Forks region. We aren't intending to do a, uh, a mass um, kind of um, pie in the sky outreach to anybody. If you're looking already for a job here, if you're looking for a home here, you're looking to relocate in this area. And so we wanna reinforce that and help um, hopefully convince people that that's a, a good decision and you're gonna find a good, a good home here along with that career opportunity that you have. Um, we will be throughout the course of this um, targeting um, UND and NCTC alums, um, students, reinforcing that we want you to stay here or come back here, high school area alums, all of those people that already have a connection here or who are fam familiar with the region are going to be those that are gonna be more likely to relocate here if there's an opportunity to do so. So um, our social media sites and a hashtag that we've started that we're really encouraging people to use. And I'll give you a very recent example. We had a, an individual who was out at a movie night at the park and used the hashtag GF is cooler um, to share something that she was doing, something that is a family event that, that is the type of thing that we hope to be able to share with others so that they, when they're out on social media or they come to our website, they're gonna embrace the region like we do and all of the, all of the cold, all the heat, all the fun, all the flavor that we have here to offer. So um, that really is a, a brief summary of, of what we're setting out to do and I'd welcome any questions or input, and at the very least, I'd welcome you to go out and follow those social media sites and use that hashtag when you're at RibFest or if you're <laughs> doing um, any events in the area or activities. For your information, we have, we have a, we're having a discussion with some realtors after this, so there are realtors yeah. in here also who yep. might find this exactly interesting the, site. Yeah. Yeah, the intent of the site, like I said, and, and this resource is not to replicate what's out there. Um, I don't, you know, I won't go through section by section, but to be able to, uh, you know, in, in certain areas we've got links to resources. It's not intended to be an advertising site for one company over another, but more of a general, you know, we're not, it, it, we're not replicating the Chamber of Commerce or the CVB listings of businesses and services we'd refer to those sites for that kind of information. But um, to really, again, just provide that overview and that, 
that sense of, of living and working here is really where we're starting with, with this effort. If somebody has an idea about something that could be added or supplemented to this, should they get in touch with you? Absolutely, yep. And do you want to tell everybody who you are and where you're at so they <laughs> can know who you are? Doris Cooper at the Grand Forks Region Economic Development Corporation. And we have a, um, a group of committee members that are, have helped provide um, input and guidance into, into the development of this and ongoing. We'll be helping um, build this out as well. We've had uh, feedback initially already of some things that, that were suggested to be added or um, looked at and we've been able to do that and that's one of the beauties of a living, breathing document like a website is, it, like I said, it's never done. Um, we have the opportunity to continue to build on it including um, over the course of the next few months you're going to see some video added. Uh, we haven't quite gotten to that yet so we're building that resource out as well of having people really show and tell their stories about why they live here. So. I, I just have one thing to add, and that is that I would really encourage different businesses and different organizations to incorporate parts of this as they see fit into their own website. I know you're going to see a lot of this will be on the Chamber website six months from now as we redesign our website. The EDC is going to include some, all those lead sponsors. Like Doris said, the Air Force Base has adopted this because they are in a major recruitment effort. Northrop Grumman, General Atomics, they're going to use this same type of theme on their websites and expect a lot of local employers who are looking to bring people from other, other areas to our community will use this site, but they're also going to incorporate pieces into it so it looks seamless and so that the two work together. So I, I think that's important that the realtors, everybody else in the community is on board with this so we end up having a greater, broader impact and more people see it and it's continued to be reinforced. So that'll be important. And to Barry's point, you know, we've developed a toolkit right. for employers that, that includes things like the logo, like some um, banner ads. We can coordinate and throughout the process and what we talked about with the HR advisory group that helped with this is if, if there's a specific recruitment effort for a particular position or a recruitment effort that one of the employers is doing in a, in a specific area, we can help augment that with some targeted um, posts on social media that we can boost into that area and help reinforce the Grand Forks message while they're selling the, the company message. So really work hand in hand to help in that effort. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. We're Thanks. Thank you, Doris. Thanks, Barry. Going to move into uh, new business, the realtor surcharge. As I said in the report some months ago, the city approved a surcharge for city owned lots that are being sold by way of a realtor. And we have, Ron and I have in particular, I don't know whether others have, have received some feedback on that that says this is not being very well received, to put it mildly. So when it came up the last time when I was talking to a realtor's meeting, I suggested that maybe the realtors need to come back and present their case back to the EDA and ultimately to the city council and they know that the city council meetings at five, but that during the summer, that's the time they have a lot of open houses uh, and showings. So what they are asked to do is defer that until after Labor Day for that portion, the city council portion. So John Coulter is here from the Realtors, and he will introduce uh, his colleagues who are here today so that you know with whom you're going to be talking and who's going to be talking to you. Hi, thanks Paul, thanks for inviting us here. My name is John Coulter, I'm the Executive Officer of the Grand Forks Area Association of Realtors. Uh, with me today is uh, David Blumkin from First Realty, Linda Hartman from Greenberg Realty, Stacey Ballstead from Greenberg Realty, and Rhonda Bonetta from Century 21 Red River Realty. Um, there's been some issues, I guess, with the lots in these Grand Forks, and I'm really not familiar with the way you guys are marketing them or anything, and that's 
that's not my concern. What is a concern of, the, of my membership is that uh, if, an, if a real estate agent was to bring forth a client, that client would pay more for a lot if there was a commission involved in it than someone who just came in uh, off the street. And so that's the thing that, uh, that we're concerned with mostly is uh, we think that you're cutting out a big portion of potential buyers by eliminating the, the real estate agents or the realtors in, in the community. So that's why we have this. I see, I see this as a dialogue or discussion between the EDA members and the realtors from the, and to the, so that the EDA board understands in full the realtor's position and, and the, you know, what it does and what might be other solutions. I mean, I've heard one solution that says, let's change every lot price by $1,000, create a pool that can be used as a fund to be able to pay realtor commissions because our pricing isn't built to include realtor commissions right now. But if there are other suggestions or solutions, I think those need to be presented to this board and then ultimately to the city council. Okay. Yeah, um, no, it will, it will. As a group, we can't negotiate with them. Okay? We're, um, there's, there's certain rules and laws that we have to follow. So I can't come and speak on behalf of, of the brokers in town. So it's whatever you guys decide to do, and then it's up to the brokers whether they want to accept this or, or, or yes. Who makes the rules? Uh, antitrust. It's antitrust laws. On the, uh, it's yeah, federal antitrust around, laws that affect all realtors. All around realtors, brokers, two brokers to, to negotiate party together. Oh, okay. I get it. I understand. So I have to be very, very careful on, on how we talk. And then also, I'm not a realtor. I do not have a real estate license. So if you have market questions or something like that, then I'm going to have to bring up one of my colleagues because I can't speak like, like I have a license. Um, you know, whatever you guys want to decide, but the way you're doing it right now, you're, you're, there's 250 um, members of our MLS in Grand Forks. And by not, or by charging more for your lots, if one of them brings in a customer, uh, you're kind of shutting them out. Because what's going to happen is, is the customer will find out that hey, if I just come in and negotiate with Paul on my own, I can get this lot for X amount of dollars less, okay? If you have a set rate on all of them, then that will encourage the realtors rather than, uh, rather than trying to push their customers to other spots, they may come over here and, because the lots are reasonable, the lots also include specials, which is a great thing, so. It's, there should be no reason why they're not selling. However, the market is the market is the market too. I mean, there's no guarantee they're going to sell. Even if you do change. So the only guarantee is the market will change. Correct, and it has changed yeah. a lot yeah. in the last year. So. I'll I'll speak to this. Just kind of observe this and tried to absorb it and tried to understand it. It's complicated. I don't get it, so it needs to be dumbed down for me sometimes. Um, there are. To, there's opposing views within the elected body and that's that's normal it's natural it's healthy one is that we can sell them on our own we don't have to pay a commission they think it's just throwing away money and the other side is that you guys work for a living you work really hard and you need to get paid for it that's a in simple terms that's the argument and I feel caught in the middle of it sometimes <laughs> but um, I'm going to I'm going to let the people that feel strongly about this um, argue it out. Let the people of East Grand Forks throw someone out that they disagree with at the next election, and that's how we're going to settle this. So, uh, and as Paul said, this is a discussion. We don't have to make a decision tonight, but um, eventually we should. And I would I would hope that we have a decision by. The next building season so we can 
we can dig holes in the spring or get get ne next year's uh, construction moving, whichever way it goes, one way or another. Yeah. And as I said, one option that has been suggested to me is to have a put it revise our light price listings because our prices are good. To revise our price listing by a thousand dollars per lot to create a pool that could be used for realtor commissions, so we can enlist the realtors to help us sell these last 52 lots. The home buyer wants to know the bottom line. They don't care about the details. Um, one thing I'd just like to touch on is that um, do. I understand um, your guys' concern <clears throat> as you want to do what's best for your client. <clears throat> Excuse me. Get them the best price available, and then if they do find this out, then it might not drive people to you guys just come to us to buy the lot. Um, a little history on it is that um, all the lots out there on the golf course, I believe, are pretty much priced at break even. So the reason for adding the additional amount to pay the commission is because we're going to lose money on that lot then based on, hey, they weren't moving for a long time. We priced them with the specials to just break even on what we had into them. Um, now, with that being said, the price of the lots with some people that bought out there right away were significantly higher than even what somebody will buy one at right now with the commission added into it. So there is kind of a couple different sides to all of this also. Like I said, I do understand your guys' concern that <clears throat> you don't want people to bypass you guys to come buy the lots through us. And I think you guys are a huge advocate to, to push the business to hey, maybe you want to look at this lot and build a house over here on this side of the river, look at the price of the lots. Um, but to keep in mind also that there are people that bought lots out there significantly higher before we lowered them to try to drive the business also. And we had done that at a time when I believe they were still listed on MLS um, and there wasn't a lot happening. And I guess the board took it upon itself to make the decision to what do we what can we do what can we do different and that was the solution at the time um, I don't know what City Council will want to do or how you look at it to make sure that you guys can get a cut of it and help drive the business over here also um, you know just wanted to bring up a little history on it too of that there are people that bought out there to begin with at significantly higher prices also and we we knew that that could be a backlash of going okay we dropped the price on those lots by 30%. What are the people that bought the lots at the original price going to come back and say to us? You know, we, have to, we had to look at it and say, well, they were fortunate enough to get to pick the lot that they wanted because they moved out there right away. Um, and I guess that's a consequence they had to deal with then because they moved out there right away compared to waiting 10 years and then we dropped the prices. So, um, you know, the lots have been all over on price. Um, I would like to see you guys be a part of it also and be able to contribute. Um, I don't have an answer of how we can make that difference of trying not to lose money for the city and then also get you guys paid, though. Don't get me wrong, though. The city can decide how they want to do this either way, and we will accept whatever they just we're just trying to make the case here that you may have an easier time selling them if you get this group involved. They're the professionals mm -hmm. and things like that. So okay, just if, you know. Well, and, and, I, and I basically, I'm going to say this as Joe Blow public because I see both sides of it. I'm not saying this on the side of the city council as the city attorney. What I'm looking at is you got 250 realtors out there that are your marketing team, that is your selling team, and you're not utilizing them because you're giving them no incentive to even direct anybody over here. And just by virtue of our marketing effort at this point, it hasn't been very successful as a city to move those lots without their help. And we've tried a number of different ways to do it. So I don't believe it's them saying, hey, we want a cut of your business. 
It's them saying, hey, if you want to truly market these things and utilize our services as a sales force that's in town, then we, for our efforts, should be paid some money to do that. And they, from my understanding, are having a hard time saying to their client, oh, by the way, let's go look over in East Grand Forks when they can buy it for cheaper without them. And so you're, alienate that, you're alienating that group <clears throat> from even attempting to market the lots for you. It, it's a catch-22. So, and, and, and that's what it basically comes down to from my outside perception and, and, and observation. But I think we should make a decision on this sooner than later because actually your pre-planning for spring digging starts by September. So we've been selling lots for quite some time, correct? Well, we've trying. Been selling, we've been trying to sell lots for quite some time. We have well, 52 lots left right now. Prior, prior to me coming in, do we have any data basically showing, like, how many how many, how many many things were sold in East Grand Forks in a particular year versus how many lots did we sell that year that shows when we were using the MLS versus not? And we can back it up with some data? Do we have that? Excuse can we come up with that? I need to jump in here. Kind of talking about two different things. The MLS is a completely separate entity. That would be a completely. Then we would have to enter into some negotiations of how we're doing it. Okay. We're not talking about putting money in the MLS. Well, I guess compared no. to what we had the lots. John, I, I think the, if I may, Dan. Sure. I think the question was when <coughs> lots were listed on MLS, how many lots were sold, versus when the lots are off MLS, how many lots were sold. That's, Rel that's relative to the market at the time. How many were at total sold? I mean, you know, to me, if we could bring some data into this and look at it, that would kind of help make decisions. Would be my thought. Is that something that we can get? Can I get how many were sold on MLS versus total sales? I don't know. I, I need some help on those statistics. I should be able to get some. I can't. I can't give you what hasn't been sold on the MLS, but I can give you. Hopefully, I can give you numbers of what was sold when when uh, we had the agreement with the city of East Grand Forks on the MLS. So, uh, so that would be nice to see. Game. I mean, just, you know, if we're going to go through this and we're going to compare two different, you know, things that we've done, I mean, it'd be nice to see how it worked, especially, I mean, I'm new to the board and everything. I'd like to see how it went. And, I mean, if it was a plus, that would help. The problem that I have here is when they were on the MLS, you know, the way it works, the agent would bring someone in to see the, the uh, Paul, and then Paul would work with them, and then it may close out, and I may never hear about it closing out when it was on the MLS, or mean the MLS maybe wouldn't have been reported on the MLS. Yeah, okay. Because it's, you know, when you're talking lots, you're talking uh, um, listings that are pretty much identical all the way, so there may only have been one on the MLS, you know what I mean? Yes, I am aware. The other thing that if I had MLS dates, I can look at the sales agreements also because our sales agreement has let, ask, have you used a realtor or assistance in buying this lot? So I can look at that for each lot that has been sold over the years and see how many had realtor, had realtor assistance in the sale of that lot. It would be nice to see some of the, the statistics there to see really weigh out the cost benefits and actually, you know, if city council needs to make a decision on this sooner rather than later, the sooner we get that information, the better informed we can be at least in this situation. It's my thought. The other thing I would point out is that we need to think about how quickly we want all these lots sold too. And tomorrow. I was thinking yesterday, but that's okay. I'll give you till I'm tomorrow. giving them time. <laughs> um, but that way, it will tell us if we need, to the degree to which we need to ask for assistance too. Correct. Okay. So th that's that's the other thing that goes into all of this. So let me see what I can pull for data. And um, the uh, that you guys have to think about the degree to which you think that with assistance we can increase the sales for these lots. Carla, on that, 
sale of them lots, the incentive is in there also, correct? Well, the $5,000 incentive is yep. in for any lot in town. So that's actually a question that... No, 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 but right now that's in that price. Yes. Our oh, price includes the incentive plus the landscaping plus the uh, no. tax abatement. Oh, those are separate. And when, when you look at the lot, it just has the lot price. Okay. But then we also look, have to look at our budget and figure in if for every lot we So that sell, comes out of a different budget? Well, it comes out of the same fund, that's 280 fund, but, you know, there's $7,000 in that fund right now. But, well, so when you get, but when you get, when you sell the lot, then you get the lot price, and X amount of goes to And then that's what goes back into 280 to, yeah. to fund that, to keep bringing it back yes. and forth. Okay. On our lots, when we sell a lot, part of it goes into to the, well, part of it will go to pay the specials. Part of it is set aside in the 280 account, which is where we pay the incentives from. Okay. And our lot price is basically set at the, the, the uh, specials plus the amount of money that's necessary to pay for the incentives associated with that lot. So it, if I'm understanding you correctly, technically we could do away with the incentives and still have realtors on our side keep the... That, that is an option. I guess because yes. what my whole point is behind that is, is obviously it ain't an incentive to buy. I think the one thing you're losing out there is, is once again, the realtors are losing for their client because you take the incentive away they can go to another lot in East Grand Forks that's not owned by the city, sell them that lot, get the commission, and then the client can still get the incentive. So taking the incentive away is it's kind well, of doing Unless you took it away in the, in have, the entire you city. Right. Yeah, you got to take it away the, all the way across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Is what it, I'm it, saying. Is that actually the case? I mean, we have the realtors here. We could ask them. I mean, it, is the incentive a, a big selling point, as you see, or is it not really a big selling point? Or, I mean... You guys are the professionals. I'd like to hear your opinion. Okay, so what are the incentives? Three incentives. First is a $5,000 forgivable loan. Second is a landscaping uh, rebate for, uh, it goes for shrubs and trees. It doesn't go for things like sod or soil or fertilizer or somebody doing the work for you. It's for the actual materials, and we do not pay sales tax on that either. The third thing is when you become up to full taxation, there are two years of property tax abatement. You pay your taxes. Those are rebated to you. That usually happens in the spring after your home has come up to full valuation and full taxes for the previous year. So in other words, you would have had to pay tax, full taxes on your home for a 12-month period, and then there would be a rebate on that. A 10-year period. Ten so over years. a 10-year period, if you're in the home for 10 years, it is forgiven. Yeah. I'm sorry. Incentives are always nice. Yes, but I mean, what, is that is that a make or break a deal on selling a lot over here? See, I don't either. Which. Are any of these things that stand out? Should we, should we give them a microphone? Just so that people can hear them off. I would say the tax incentive is huge. Stacy, we need you. Is on? Oh, now you're on the spot. <laughs> is it on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, it's not. It's not lit up. There you are. The tax abatement incentive. Yes. Yes. Um, the landscaping, I think, is probably the least of anybody's worries, just because you know. They don't worry about that at the time. No, no they don't think about that at the time. <laughs> they don't. I didn't. And when the I bought mine. five thousand dollar incentive. When you look at the fact Wait, that most people else. are typically in their home an average of seven years. A lot of people look at it like I'm not going to be here 10 years, then I have to pay it back. I'd rather not have it to begin with. You know, I've heard that it's before. Really. The only thing I wanted yep. to touch on, too, I just wanted to touch on as far as the data that, that you're receiving, you know, um, typically, you know, characteristically, the market ebbs and flows. 
and it's kind of, you know, it just cycles. So if we're pulling data from when it was on the MLS and it was a hot market, it's truly not going to reflect what we're doing right now. So right. there could be just, you know, a little bit of... Um, Maybe I should clarify. Like, it would be nice to see those lots, but also in addition to that, would also to be see the market trend too at that point in time. Mm -hmm. If it was a hot cycle, I mean, that, that would have to, that, that, that would have to come with it in order to make a, a sensible decision. Be well, which it would have been because it had been post flood, right? So it would have been a little hotter then. Oh, absolutely. Right. Like right now, it's it's not that way. Exactly. And, well, and that would be what I would want to compare is, is oh, right. how many do we sell at that time relative to the number of total okay. lots or homes, however we want to do it, were sold at that point. Yeah. So. I, I understood that's what you're Yeah, that's what, okay. Yeah. okay. I, I just don't know if that number is available, but I understand that's what you I'd like to about. investigate if it is. I mean, it would just give credence to either way, I think, what we're seeing or not at all. Go ahead, Mike. Paul, what's a realistic timeline for this to go through the process, come back to us, go up to the council. Just, I know well, September might be a little optimistic. September, the first work session in September is when we're shooting to have the realtors come back to the city council. That's probably the best time to try to have all the data together. Um, and when so mid -sep we mid September, it could, best case scenario, come to the council. Uh, you have to look at a calendar. I don't need numbers. Even I just need uh, just to get the ball rolling. And September fifth for us and September twelfth for council. Okay. What I'm thinking. So October first sounds like a good day. Meet in the middle. <laughs> um, I just have one I have a question for the realtors. Um, looking at a, a lot being priced three thousand dollars difference, so you guys are able to get compensated also. <laughs> Um, is it, is it, how big of a concern is it when you look at a lot, maybe similar size in Grand Forks that, um, more than likely costs quite a bit more than even that additional 3000 and specials higher compared to showing them a lot that yes, they might pay $3,000 more than if they go to the city to buy it. But, um, I, in my mind, I'm thinking that when, when people are working with realtors, that they're working with a realtor for a reason. They want to work with the realtor. They want the realtor to take care of what you guys take care of for them, the paperwork, um, the discussions, negotiations. Um, do you foresee that it is greatly going to lose a sale for you guys by that additional 3000 You do. Can I, can I pitch in here? It always has struck me that it's easier to discount a price than it is to increase a price for a surcharge. Think if you went into a car dealership, for example, and if you used a, a car broker to buy, help you buy the car, you get charged $3,000 more for that. Would you buy at that dealership or would you go to someplace else and try to buy it on your own? Whereas if you went in and they discounted because you came in without any assistance, you walk away with a better feeling on that. I mean, just, is that a fair perspective? Well, and I understand that. My question just, I guess, kind of comes in on if we've got a lot for 45000 here with the additional 3000 compared to forty two, or they look at a lot in Grand Forks that might be 65000 and then they end up buying that one. Um, that's where I'm wondering where does the I think that's where the Joneses come in. Well and and, and Why are you I'm serious. You know, and, and that's what I'm just trying to people are gonna pay to build in grand I'm serious. Yeah, I'm serious. Yep. Yeah. And that's what I'm I guess I'm good. I'm trying to run through my head and try to figure out is is that three thousand really gonna make or break it when some people might look at that and then they end up going across the river and buying a lot for twenty thousand more anyways. Um that's what I'm trying to run through my head and try to figure out. And I don't think we have a shot at those people anyway. Well, maybe not. I mean, that's my thought. And I mean, regardless and of three thousand dollars, I mean, if they're going to go spend twenty thousand more on the other side of the river, obviously, if it wasn't what they wanted. They want to be on the other side of the river. I'm just trying to run it through in my head as a standpoint of how the realtors feel about it, how everybody feels, because 
I want them involved. You know, like like Ron said, you got a sales force of 250 people to sell those lots for us. What better way to sell those lots? Um, what it sounds like they're saying is is that if they come to the city and we're 3,000 less, why don't we just tack on the 3,000 onto ours? And we put that in the 280 fund towards another incentive to the realtors and whoever sells the most throughout the year will give them a, a bonus. They're still going to go to the realtors because they're getting the service from the realtor as compared to us. That's well, another I, idea. And I, and I think the problem that you're running into is in general in, this, in, in the real estate business, the seller pays the commission. And, and what you're doing is you're taking a buyer and saying, okay, buyer, now the seller's refusing to pay a commission, so you've got to take and pay the commission on my behalf. And it's just, a, it's just the rub. It was you know, the way muddy, it, muddy, muddy water. You know, it's, it's the way it, it just kind of comes across. And so it's, it's very difficult for the, the, the workforce out there to request that the, the buyer pay the commission on behalf of the seller. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but well, yeah, try to deal that's with them. what's happening when we increase their lot by 3,000, they're paying the commission. That's why I say incentive. But it's the price of the lot. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the way you look at it. You know, right. it's the price of the lot is, is there. It's one thing. But if you're adding on top of the price of the lot so you can utilize somebody's uh, profession. Or, you add it on <laughs> and, and that's kind of one thing that I was trying to run through my head too in asking the question that I did of how much will it hurt the sale because how many of those buyers are finding out that they could have bought it for 3000 cheaper by doing it themselves? So it's kind of like the... When they talk to the neighbor. Yep. Well, you know, but like I said earlier, some of those, some of those people out there paid $20,000 more than what those lots are now. So if they're, if they're talking to a neighbor that's building at the same time as them that went through the city, then yes. But you could talk to a neighbor across the street and they could say, well, you paid 45, I paid 70 for mine. You know, I mean, it, it's all over the place out there right now, but um, I do think we do need to find a resolution to try have the sales force involved. And, I, I think you just need to keep in mind, I think the lot value for most of those lots is $5,485 or something, $5,400, say $5,500. So you just have to look at what is that $5,500, what do you want that to cover in the future? Does it cover your tax abatement or does it cover your incentive? Is really what it comes down to. Right. Because that's all you're going to get for each one of those lots. Be they be either $35,000, $25,000, or $45,000. There are, every lot is worth about $5,400. And so for the fund to continue to fund, be it tax abatements or incentives, that's all you have to work with. And so it's just a decision. Like you said, you do take out the tax incentive, and that three of that thousand of that 5400 could, could go without raising the rates to the, the seller, to that, you know, to that broker. And then the leftover $2,400 goes towards the cost of the tax abatement, which is typically, what, $3,400 a year? Roughly. So, each, you know, so you're saying 7000 of each one of those lots is a tax abatement, in essence. Mm -hmm. Can I just interject something? I talk to most of those people when they're looking at lots, and all of them are very excited about the incentives we run now, the $5,000, the tax abatements. Um, I have lots of people that call and say, I just talked to my neighbor and they're getting tax abatements. Why haven't I got mine yet? Well, it's because their tax, their house hasn't reached full value, but you're gonna get into some sticky waters if you eliminate a tax abatement for the realtor fee because they're gonna call and wonder why they're not, so you'd have to spell it out, I think, if that's what you're No, it'd be across the board. Oh. anyone here sold from here on out 
So all of the lots would be All of them, not just gotcha. not okay. just the one that okay. a realtor that would sell. That, that's what I was going after. Make it fair and cut and dry and because I yeah, you would be kidding. Oh. Basically, if I understand it, if we decide to eliminate an incentive, it'll be if you say if you buy your lot by X date, the incentive will be available. If you don't buy by X date, it will not be available. Regardless of where you're building in the city, or we could do like the big box stores, raise the prices, tell them we got a sale, and <laughs> marketing genius. Yeah, they think they got a deal. It's a clearance. Yeah, no, I that's where I think a guy should go, but I think the problem with taking away with that tax get rid of the, some of them incentives away, to offset the that. Homeowner feels like it's being set. The guy down. on the Titanic. Yeah. Because of a 250 of them, that's a quarter of a lot each sold. That's no problem. Keep keep in mind that the incentive was 10,000 to start with, right after the flood, and went down to five. And you know, I'm I'm sure at some point in time, we're just going to have to do away with it because we don't have money. Correct. And we're we're close to that point. There's 7,000 in the fund right now. And it's 10000 to mow them all this year. Pardon? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so I mean, exactly. that's the reality. I'm serious. What, let me ask the question of what will the realtors, what would you guys like to see? I mean, I, I, I understand, yes, you want to get paid, so you want to see that, but at, what do you guys see as a solution of, do you want to see these incentives taken away from a client that might buy a lot and have the incentive in order to get the commission, or do you guys have other thoughts? on how to be compensated on it and what incentives we need to keep and I'd keep the tax abatement and the 5,000 forgivable I think that's a lot of people forget about that anyway remember when Obama did his $8,000 I had people jump in on that and then they ended up paying it back and that hurt at the sale I think Stacy said the average is, is seven years that they own the home anyway, so they'd have to pay it back. Am I correct? Okay. That's yeah. still, yep. average. That's still the NAR. Do you guys see that as the average of like taking the golf course into consideration that we're talking about? Do you guys see that as, since all, those are some bigger homes that are built, and I guess it seems like those are more forever homes, do you still see the turnover on those homes that quickly? They're turning over on King's Walk, so. Okay. Yeah, that's hard to predict. Right. Well, and, and I'm just asking I mean, purely from a standpoint of what <laughs> you may have seen personally, not asking statistically wise, just right. curious. Right. Probably a, a higher end home, they're going to stay in a little bit longer, but you know, we've got jobs, we've got, yep. there's a gamut of things that can change that. And in a higher so end home, hard. is 5000 forgivable really a big deal? It sounds like we have information to think about and come back in early September and discuss it further and then make a recommendation also to the City Council at that time. And this will also go to the City Council in September. Okay. Thanks John. for inviting us. Uh, again, whatever you decide, we'll try and work with you. John, thank you for making sure we have the realtors here today too. And all of you, thank you for coming in here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be right back. No, they're not on the agenda. Let me get the Sacred Heart. This is what I'm getting at. Okay. It's not on the agenda. Oh. There are only one of many surplus properties. They, they have submitted a sales agreement. But basically, they don't want to ask him where it's going. Okay. So let's find out what's going on. Okay. Just as a non agenda, agenda item? Yes, it's an off agenda item. Okay. Um, moving on with uh, off agenda item, we have some other guests here that um, you'd like to stand up and let us know what you're here for. And Add a microphone. 
So I'm Len Van Isaac. Uh, I represent Sacred Heart uh, Parish and School. Very well. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and <clears throat> some time back, uh, we had placed an offer on some property that is adjacent to, um, next to the property that Sacred Heart does own uh, for possible parking lot, possible expansion, and so forth. And so what I'm here for today is more curiosity than anything, find out uh, what is uh, what has been discussed, what the um, uh, future will be. Uh, David's not here. I have talked with the, we have received finally the appraisal on that property, and I have talked with the city manager and we are intending uh, because there are people absent today, we're intending to take it to the city council at the first meeting next month, work session, and I would also be bringing the information to this body. I would point out that both times, because it has to deal with land sales, that it will be in closed session because it deals with land pricing and everything like that. So that, but that's how we're proceeding and that's what the city policy calls for anyway. And I will point out further as it moves along and as it goes public, by the city policy, there will have to be a public hearing on all of this as well at the city council level. Okay, does that help? Okay. That does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, back into on track on the agenda. We'll move into approval of minutes for our June 20th regular meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? See you later. Uh, bills and communications, uh, review of accounts payable for July 5th, 2017. Need, need approval? No, just just need an approval. So just review on July 5th and July 18th. So if there's any questions on either of them. I approve them anyway. <laughs> Then I'm going to have the second one. <laughs> <laughs> Eat it. The gallon's down. <laughs> um, if no questions on the bills and communications, we'll move into report reports or delinquency update. We have no delinquencies at this time. Yay. And uh, financial reports for June. Um, attached are the reports. Um, the first one is the 620 fund, which is the um, EDA general fund administrative fund. Um, there wasn't anything out of the ordinary as expenses, payroll, other such items. Um, if you notice, the cash balance is 78000 in the whole. That's because at the end of the year, we actually transfer in general fund dollars that have been levied to cover whatever the cost has been for the year. Uh, if you look at Fund 630, which is a Sunshine Terrace, um, as you can see, the cash balance is 883000 and the debits and the credits um, have to do with normal expenses. There is a few repairs in there, um, and then rent collected. You can look at the detail attached. Uh, fund 625 is the IRP loan fund, which has no activity in it. Um, we paid off the loan to... USDA and we have no loans outstanding on that and the balance is 466,957 if you look at the fund 682 which is an infill building which we collect rent and we did have um, normal expenses we did have some repairs but we do know we are putting those uh, roof units in and the cash balance is $310,000 the next one is the 633 fund which is a down payment assistance we have one outstanding at this time, and they're making regular monthly payments, and the fund bal the cash balance is 206000 in that. Um, the 280 fund is that a housing lot incentive fund, which uh, encompasses all those lots we own. It also pays for the tax abatements. It also pays for the incentives, and we have a cash balance of $7,000 in that. And um, you can see we actually did give out some $5,000 in incentives this month. There was um, one, we gave the tax abatement to the Valley Gulf, and there actually was two $5,000 incentives. And then we also gave a few $500 
um, incentives for landscaping, and then we did pay $5,500 for the mowing. Um, then we have Fund 626, which is the MIF loan fund, which we have a number of outstanding. Um, as Paul said, there is uh, none in delinquent, and so we are collecting um, interest and payments in that. And then we, oh, we have the 280 again, so that would be all the funds that entail to EDA. Any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving into unfinished business, uh, director's report. I have talked with Peter Swenson from Cutting Edge. He is going to be providing me with some information. Um, and we'll discuss it at that time, but in essence, he's telling me some things that uh, my predecessor uh, had talked to him about and that you need to make a decision ultimately on what to do. We figured out what the monthly interest calculation is. It's a little bit over $220 per month that's accumulating that loan. And I've talked with him about when he's going to start to be able to pay principal as opposed to interest as well. But all that information will be forthcoming when, when he gets me that email. He promised it sometime in the next week or so. Okay? Rome, Minnesota? Business. Yes, Barry's no longer here, but Barry and I have been visiting companies, and we've been accompanied recently by both Tim and Mike as we have visited companies locally. Uh, Barry's office is doing the coordination for setting up the meetings, which has been very nice, and it's greatly appreciated. Um, yesterday, for example, we were at North, um, we were at North, uh, RJ Zeverell and Stennis Granite. Uh, recently, we also went to Northland Custom Woodworking, and we have up meet, upcoming meetings scheduled with Northdale Oil, Fertile Lawn, and one was scheduled today for uh, Dakota Peat. Okay. So if you're looking for, and, and if Mike comes, it'll take an hour, but normally it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do these meetings. Oh, wait a minute now. When Barry <laughs> comes. <laughs> When you and Barry are there, you talk about cubs well, and about the well, twins. And the gentleman we were with, also I learned a lot of the inside baseball of his yes. business. So baseball is everywhere. He was 45 minutes of baseball and 15 minutes That's not of a top one. It's a home run for everybody. Baseball is the yeah. best sport of all the sports. You're on it's camera. Way you better than it's way better than football. <laughs> Second to hockey. <laughs> I'll second that. I thought you liked fishing. I'll go to hockey first. Okay. So anyhow, that's what's going on out there. And um, I'll try to make sure people know when meetings are scheduled. I gave you the two dates here. Uh, if anybody has time available on the 9th, the meeting is on the afternoon of the 9th with Dakota Pete. Okay. The one thing we were hearing is skilled workers are needed. By almost all the companies that's going to continue to get worse right have you checked with the school district on trying anything uh, northland uh custom woodworking has done some work with the school district and with with northland and community technical yep. college as well and that's that's normal that they have talked with the school districts and with the uh, nctc as well only like the Grand Forks has a school to career program where they're actually with the businesses. So yeah, it, it, yeah. the problem is we're not graduating, keeping enough of those employees, enough of those potential employees, and that's part of what the North Valley Career Northern Valley Career Expo is about. It's part of what the oh. career days and career activities that are at NCTC and UND are about, and it's part of what Way Cooler is all about as well. Is how can we keep potential employees, particularly skilled employees, and how can we bring more into this area, okay? And I know they do a, something in the schools. Yes. Well, a bunch of the contractors come in and talk. Yes. And in fact, I have given some more information to Northern Valley Career Expo on a program that's being done in, down in David's hometown. Which, uh, Hutchinson. Hutchinson, yeah, thank you. 
that they're doing, they're actually uh, creating academies and having, they're in the process of starting to require, in the next school year or two, they will start to require an internship to get your high school diploma. So you're out in the field and seeing what actually happens in the field. Did any of these businesses express like specific skill sets that they were looking for or what they see as being a challenge that perhaps we can help them out with? Or? Skilled labor generally, mm. it, okay. equipment handling, um, whether it's external equipment like big equipment or the, when they're dealing with equipment uh, that's inside machinery. But it's basically people who are skilled in some kind of machine skills, whether it's big machines, running big machines, or running machines inside of a uh, egg business. What do they just see as a reason why they're le like, how can we help them retain those people? How are they seeing us fitting into? Well, part of it is housing costs. Okay. Part of it is housing available. Part of it is having workers available. Part of it is exposing kids when they're in, uh, when they're in school. Exposing kids. He's going to finish making that statement. Give aware, him a second, oh, Ron. Making kids aware that there are jobs available in the, for skilled workers and that <laughs> you have to think, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Tell where you got, what gutter your minds are in. I'm glad we put this on, on TV, guys. Yes. The lawyer's fault. Yeah, that was my fault. Um, I mean, it's basically making sure kids are aware that there are jobs and that not, college doesn't doesn't prepare you for every every job that you're going to be doing over your career. And there are a lot of jobs that require very high levels of expertise that don't require a formal college education, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. There are a lot that do, but there are a lot that don't. And you need to be thinking about what are, you, what are your actual long-term career goals and does that require a degree? And I know that discussion's gone on for many, many years but it's becoming increasingly important with the shortage of skilled laborers. Oh, we'll move back into new business, um, surplus properties. We identified, the staff got together and identified several properties. If I can find them in here, I'll pull them out. Um, you had asked us to identify these properties, we did it. Do you see anything on here that stands out as not being? Should not be included. What's the the lot behind Cabela's? Which which one's that? There's one that's between two houses on the street that's behind uh, Cabela's. Oh. Okay, and it's got a utility line through there, and we're doing a locate on it right now to see if it's even if it can be sold or if we have to retain it for the utilities. Okay. If if there's room on it to sell, then it then it can be saleable. But if there's not room on it to to uh, put in a house then we will hold on to it because we need it for the utility. Right? There's so, a utilities on there. Yeah. Was, correct me if I'm wrong, but was that lot or that area zoned commercial after the flood that a house couldn't be built there? I thought I heard that. I don't know. It's, I think it's the same thing. It was, because you know, now I know, yeah, that it's got the utilities on it big time. And there are houses on either side of it. Yeah. Like there the, was a house there mm -hmm. uh, and they got torn down after the flood. There's the electrical service that's going through there right now. Yeah, so I can't. I can't answer your question. I don't okay. know the answer to that. I just thought that I'd heard that. Could we that. still sell it to the neighbor? Uh, that's a possibility. Just because then we have somebody at least taking care of it. I'm assuming that person probably taking care of it, and we're not reimbursing them for yeah. mowing it. When we know somebody where the utilities are, that becomes a possibility. Because if you look, several of these are sale to adjoining property owner because they're too small to do anything with or, or their utility lines and you can't do anything with them. So there are only a couple pieces. Uh, I talked to the police chief about the lot that's on the corner over here, what, on 5th and Demers, and he said he doesn't need it. So that's a piece that can be available for a possible commercial piece. Um, there are the lots that Len uh, talked about are on here. Um, there are the lots at the end of the cul-de-sac uh, on the north side, but most of the property that we identified that isn't tied up because of utility needs, uh, it's only just very small pieces to sell to adjoining property owners. Okay. So does that help? Now, I will point out that we do get other requests, one of which uh, 
water and light is looking at right now for the possibility of a sale of 40 feet of a lot that, that we own that they use for their facilities, but that 40 feet isn't necessarily something that they need and it'll be sold to the adjoining business that needs it for space for their maneuvering and for some storage as well. So we do get pieces, do get requests that don't fit into here, that don't fit neatly into here because they're parts of parcels or whatever. Um, so we'll have to deal with those as we go, but this in general covers the pieces that we talked about. Okay. Uh, moving on to Valley Gulf re revised amortization uh, table. Valley Gulf has resumed paying their loan. I handed out to you some sheets. There is a difference, a discrepancy of some 700 plus dollars between what we think they owe, what we say they owe, and what they think they owe. If you And I will go through that attachment right now because it's probably the easiest way to deal with this. You can see <coughs> that we have a, an a email from the treasurer for Valley Golf that says that they owe, a, that they should have a starting principal balance of 140,000 and interest accrual of $9,869. On the next page, you can see that we show a beginning balance of $141,219 and some change with interest accrued through the 1st of April of $9,039, but which at the time of uh, July 1st had become $9,981.09. Okay. So there's a discrepancy between the $140,000 and the $141,000 of about 700 plus dollars. I went back and took a look at the original loans. When we provided the amortization schedule and in normal practices they get, when they sign the loan, they get a copy of the amortization table. It shows the interest for the uh, initial payment on May 1st, 2009 of nearly $4,900. They ran their own table and they show the interest, in their opinion, should have been about $4,550. So there's a discrepancy that goes back all the way to there. I invited them to come to this meeting. I also posed the question, if, if you thought there was a discrepancy at the very beginning, since normally the practice is to provide the amortization table to the person borrowing the money, why didn't you say something then? Why are we doing this nine years later? Because it was a signed document, too, along with... I understand it. The other thing is, yes, I, I understand that. The other thing is, as Carla has pointed out, our numbers have gone through the... Um, the auditors have... The auditing process, the and they're audited they numbers the at this point. The interest number that yeah. we gave them. So, again. we the have... The auditors have verified the 141 as the principal and yeah. $9,039 because they had asked for the auditors to review it, yes. which we did, but they never brought up the discrepancy in the principal balance when we went through that all. And, you know, so I guess my thing is that these are audited numbers that they reviewed, looked over the audit, the auditors reviewed it and gave them that information. Yeah. So, Valley Golf wants... Their amortization table approved as opposed to the our, our updated amortization table, which will pay the interest first and then go into the principal of the loan. And I need you to decide which amortization table that we're applying. The one that went with the document when their loan was Well, you don't want to say that because we've relent them 15000 so it's updated to this document. It's the city it. created amortization. But they they had to sign for that and get that, correct? Yes. So yes, that they did. that schedule. Yes. Okay. So you want to make a motion on it? Then? A motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I just want to comment that um, Paula and I talked about it and we decided to pay that interest amount first because that's what we've used with other organizations. And then there wouldn't be any question of they were they were getting charged interest on interest. So the easiest was to put that. In. And I did send that to most all of you, and you, I know Justin agreed with it too. So I just want to make sure that was clear to everybody too. 
and Valley Golf acknowledge that interest should be paid first, and the loan documents call for interest, the dollars to be paid to the interest before they get paid to the principal. Okay? So that's how the amortization table was developed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Minnesota Thriving in the North ad proposal. Okay. We participate in the Minnesota Marketing Partnership. One of the things that's done by the Minnesota Marketing Partnership is this magazine, which I've shown you before. They have asked us if we would like to advertise in the new edition, which will be printed this fall. I've given you a page that shows what the ad rates are. In my opinion, it's... Oh, it's on the back here. In my opinion, it's probably uh, not timely at this point to spend this money on this ad, and I would suggest we hold on to that money. But if I would defer to your judgment if you if you wish to tell me I, that you'd like to do something different. There are many communities that do spend time advertising in here. Spend dollars advertising in here. much are we talking about? If we were to purchase a quarter page vertical ad, it would be $1,480. A third of a page vertical or horizontal would be $1,975. Half page horizontal would be $2,515. Half page vertical would be $3,055. Two thirds page lead, vertical page lead with online leaderboard ad, $3,635 and a full page with online medium rectangle ad is $4,170. The online display ads are normally valued at $1,200. This magazine is both a print version and there's an online version. I personally don't see. Yeah, I think we hold off. And advertising that? Not right now. I think, um, like you said, that money can be better well spent somewhere else right now. A reader board. <laughs> Towards stocks and stuff, yeah. Henry. Oh. You know, you talk about that. But there are, when, when Water and Light does do a reader, bur, reader board, I share some of the dollars with them so that we get like one third of the, or one quarter of the ads that appear on that reader board. Right. When they buy That's them. the reader board out yeah. here. So that it, it, we get a, a, some exposure, some visibility, without having a lot of expenditure on that. So it's a way to try to make people aware. Um, now that you said not to do it, I will tell you this may be the last year for this magazine, too. Uh, I call didn't want to bias the decision. Okay. The reason is, is they're looking for different ways to do it. There are other ways to provide this type of visibility so it's without spending as much money for it, too. Circling the drain? Yeah. Which way is it spinning? <laughs> <laughs> you've, got, you've got Explore Minnesota that you can get in on for probably the same money if you wanted to, but at this point, no. Yeah. There will be another ver something else next year, and we'll deal with that next year. And it'll be better once we finish the marketing plan and the strategic plan. Okay. And I've been working on that. I just don't have enough to show you right now. Snap face. Can I revisit this list of no. properties real quick? On the... Uh, no, <coughs> okay. I'm just curious on the, uh, the three that we're talking about that are south of uh, the VFW that they were just talking about. Is that, you know, would it be better off considering leasing them? I mean, every conversation that we have is that we need more parking downtown. Nobody wants to do anything because there's not enough parking. But they're on a list that we're considering as surplus for sale. So if for sale, lease, or option. Mm -hmm. just and that's the staff. It says the staff reviewed it. This isn't the city council reviewed it. The staff reviewed it. Lease is an Keep option. And I have even suggested that to Len in the past, that he think about leasing mm -hmm. them. 
I just know the conversations that we've had that there's, you know, there's complaints about parking in the downtown area. We have available parking, and and it, and I guess it was sale, a surplus property. In my mind, it was sale instead of either one not doing anything and reserving it for a later date, leasing it. Lease is an or, option. Or selling it. it for. That's from being married to a realtor. Yeah. Well, that's probably the ceiling. Like, you know, you know what that's from? That's from downtown. sitting on every city council meeting hearing how there's no parking downtown. <laughs> and I figured out how to get parking downtown. I thought I'm buying a pickup just like yours so I can pull into your stall. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Okay. But maybe no, you just, just ask the council then just to remove it off the list. You know, well, yeah, I didn't know it was on the list. Right. You know what I'm saying? Whether yeah. it's on the and list I think in the first been place. There's a discussion where it's almost shouldn't even be on the list, and that would be a question to ask. Mm -hmm. you know. what, the, what the staff did is they identified which parcels the staff would not object to because there's some possible city oh. use. So this is the remainder, and this will be vetted and could be pared down as well. Okay. It might remain as is. That's exactly right. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion. Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Meeting adjourned. Perfect. Thank you. And I apologize for my comments. <laughs> They're still on. The brown nose one. They're late for the other one. Don't make him repeat it. <laughs> Look, go watch the tape if you want to see it. Oh. <sighs>